So uh, this is my first talk, um, pretty much ever. Uh, first time talking in front of more than 10 people since like eighth grade, so I'm having like PTSD. Um, so uh, my name is uh, Devin Torres. Um, I've written uh, a few Elixir and Erlang libraries of varying popularity. Um, and uh, I'm really glad Jim uh, uh, wanted me to uh, follow the three hardest acts today. Um, so thank you. Um, but I'm also really glad that I don't have to adjust my talk anymore because people keep talking about stuff that I was going to talk about. So. That's also nice. Um, so, greetings, alchemists. Um, I hope that catches on as our like thing. If it doesn't, um, I'll be really sad. Um, so, my talk is the excitement of Elixir. Um, I'm a really excitable person uh, when it comes to technology. Um, and if I could have my way, I'd probably change my title to Chief Technology Evangelist, but um, I'd have to do more talks to get that to happen, and I don't know about that. Um, so I'm just giving this talk. It's kind of going to be a, like a whirlwind tour uh, of what's new in Elixir um, with 0 0.14, kind of. Um, but I also want people to take away talking points, kind of, um, to, I know there's a lot of people here that want to use uh, Elixir professionally, which I've done now in uh, two jobs. Um, I'm not sure how many people can say that, but uh, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking for talking points to convert um, some people, then hopefully I can give you those. Um, so the platform, uh, OTP, it's great. Um, I, I can't say that I would be using Elixir um, if it was on any other platform, um, you know, I can't imagine using it if it was, you know, on the Ruby platform or something like that. Um, fault tolerant, we all already know this. It's been, you know, beaten like a dead horse here. Um, but I just kind of want to give an anecdote um, on what brought me to Elixir. Just a quick show of hands, how many people came to Elixir um, from Erlang? Okay, so there's a sizable contingent here. Um, that's great. So um, originally um, at my last job, uh, we were heavily invested in Python. Um, all of our websites were in Python. Um, I think some services uh, were in Python. And we were having a, a lot of trouble scaling it. Um, uh, we investigated several solutions. You know, we were pretty smart dudes. Um, so we investigated, you know, heavily caching things. We were trying to scale it horizontally. Um, but we were having a lot of problems uh, just with the uh, stateful nature of Python. You know, we try to cache something or memoize something and, you know, some thing had stored some property on some property on some property somewhere. And so the whole thing would just blow up. Um, but, you know, we investigated some solutions like Twisted. Um, I spent some time with Scala. That kind of just like, it's just too much. But um, then my coworker um, came up to me one day with uh, Joe Armstrong's book. I don't know why he bought it, like on a whim or something. But uh, he uh, came up to me and we basically spent the next month reading it, I think. And uh, we ended up implementing um, a huge service that our uh, that my old company still uses uh, to this day, and half the business runs through. Um, I think we spent six months writing it, um, or maybe four months or something like that. But as soon as we were done with it, and you know, we basically ironed out some of the bugs, um, I literally forgot that it was running for like a year, and it just ran like we had no problems with it and I think that's really a property of the uh, Erlang virtual machine I think um, you can uh, just expect it to you know not start gobbling up you know tons of memory or something or um, you know you have some weird Heisen bug that just takes down your whole program um, 
And yeah, so that's great. Um, concurrency, it's already been beaten to death too. Um, I won't talk much about it, but um, I think uh, something that Robert, I believe, mentioned, um, concurrency is not uh, parallelism. Um, and Erlang is a concurrent language. And um, the thing about Erlang is um, it was built to be highly concurrent. And it wasn't until only recently that, well, relatively recently in Erlang's history that um, it started getting um, parallelism. Um, and it built that from uh, the concurrency primitives that were already in Erlang. Um, <coughs> So, um, distributed, that's already been talked about too, so I'm not gonna talk about it. Um, but it really is the future. Um, I think uh, Phoenix, I believe, is investigating some interesting things with that. It's the last thing I heard. Um, so that's gonna be pretty exciting, and I think Chris is gonna talk about that later on. So, that took me forever to make, by the way, so. Um, so the language, Elixir. Um, the thing about Elixir that I really like is it balances practicality and power. Um, I feel like Jose, with every decision that he makes, um, even though he reads a lot of academic papers, he, he doesn't... Uh, it doesn't seem like he does things with the language um, uh, just to be academic. Um, it, fe it feels like he tries to uh, make the everyday uh, lives of Elixir programmers easier. Um, macros, great. Uh, you know, they've already been talked about, so I won't go into those. In fact, I tried to come up with a uh, contrived example of a macro, and I just couldn't think of one. Um, and I think that's great because I think some people try to overuse macros. Um, and I think the takeaway that some people should take from this conference is have an API, an actual API, before you start writing macros. Um, my old coworker actually just said yesterday, uh, write it as if you didn't have macros first. And if you feel like you need a macro after you've written it a few times, then yeah. So, this was my usage of macros over time in my uh, <laughs> Elixir um, experience. Code that writes code, though. Um, that's a powerful concept. Um, and early in my uh, Elixir career, I, I really didn't get that. Um, and I actually uh, started looking into um, Elixir source code itself uh, before I got this concept. In fact, it really hit home when I was reading the Unicode uh, uh, module in Elixir. Uh, the Unicode module, if you're not familiar, actually reads the Unicode database, um, the latest Unicode database, and does some string uh, primitives, uh, build string primitives from that Unicode database wall reading it, it actually creates the module from reading that database. Um, and so here, this is just a small example from some code that I wrote that um, it reads the uh, MIME types database, the Apache MIME types database. You might find it on um, pretty much any you know, recent Linux um, ETC directory or something like that. Um, and it creates, it reads it, and it creates a function that maps extensions to their MIME types. And when I first learned this concept, it just, like, blew my mind. Um, I mean, you can do anything. You can uh, read, um, like, a TZ data uh, database and make a time library for Elixir. You can read, um, you can read a, maybe Gherkin um, cucumber uh, files and you know, create tests from that or something. So this was me after learning that concept. And uh, let's see. 
protocols. Um, I'm actually surprised that this was the only slide that I didn't have to uh, have to edit after all the talks. I don't think anybody's really talked about protocols other than a brief mention. Um, so our, uh, the current application that we're developing at uh, my current company, unfortunately we're stuck on 0 0.13.0 until uh, we deploy, right? You know, because we don't want, uh, you know, weird bugs introduced or anything like that. Um, but we use a ton of maps to, uh, to model some state in our application. And when we went to maps, there was no, uh, there was nothing uh, like put in or update in or any of the helpers that are now in Elixir. Um, they're actually in the kernel, uh, kernel.ex today. Um, none of those primitives existed. So I had to write a, uh, pretty much a poor man's put in um, from scratch. And this is kind of just like a, um, an example of what that might look like. And that's the great thing about um, Elixir is that you could, uh, you can write these kind of things if they don't exist because uh, Elixir, even 0.13, uh, they have the tools uh, that you need to write uh, powerful, um, uh, powerful constructs, powerful tools like these. Um, and so, if, as you see, it's, uh, this is just a set of functions um, that allow you to uh, get a deeply nested value from uh, nested maps or uh, put a value into a deeply nested, you know, nested maps. Um, and uh, this doesn't have syntax highlighting because apparently the code's too cool for the syntax highlighter. So, um, and this is the implementation for map. Uh, as you can see, it's just a simple um, wrapper around map.get, map.put. Um, and protocols are what some of the most powerful uh, constructs in Elixir are implemented with. Um, things like the uh, access protocol, um, which is how you can actually use the built-in, um, the built-in, you know, nested getting of maps, uh, the enum protocol, the inspect protocol. Um, that's how Elixir, you know, can actually inspect uh, meaningful, meaningfully uh, inspect things. Um, and this is just, you know, just for an example, a implementation for hash stick. And so, structs, uh, power of records, flexibility of maps. Um, I didn't want to go into um, a ton about the language itself because it's already been talked about. Um, some of the most primitive constructs like, uh, you know, pattern matching and uh, processes and, um, you know, all the niceties that Elixir gives you. I mean, a lot of us, we already know about uh, regex literals. We already know about um, multi-line strings, which, believe it or not, multi-line strings is what originally got me looking at Elixir um, more than anything because, uh, you know, when you're writing tons of SQL queries, it begins to become like a thousand needles. Um, so structs, I think, are a perfect example of um, Jose's willingness to um, enhance uh, what we already have in Erlang, enhance what Erlang already gives us. So Erlang gave us maps, and I think at a certain point, uh, Jose was thinking about just, uh, you know, we have maps now, so let's just get rid of records. And I was, I think I was like, whoa, dude, like, um, you know, that's, that's great and all, but then we don't have, um, you know, compile time checking of uh, keys or, you know, we don't have things like default values um, or anything like that. So 
I think structs were a great compromise. Uh, not really a compromise, though. I mean, I think it's you know really powerful. Um, so, so here we have uh, a character struct. Um, it's just you know it has a name and a level. By the way, the thing that got me um, into programming at a young age was uh, uh, MUDs, multi-user dungeons. So for the next few examples, we're going to be doing a little MUD. Um, so in this example, um, you know, we're, we're creating a struct with a name and a level uh, field. We're using the new derive. Um, and with derive, you can um, give structs behavior. Uh, um, you can fall back to the map um, behavior for your structs because um, user-defined structs, um, you can respond to things in protocols with your struct. Um, so as you can see, um, I create a character um, and I use the uh, access protocol on that character and it gives me back Devnus Maximus. Um, I define the uh, inspect implementation for character. Um, it just prints out the name and the level. Um, and as you can see at the very bottom, a struct is literally just a map with an underscore underscore struct underscore underscore atom. That's it. So super powerful, um, super simple when you um, understand the uh, implementation. The standard library. So um, when I started with Elixir, I think it was 2009, and I think, no, excuse me, it was 2012. I started with Erlang in 2009. But when I started, I think it may have been safe to call Elixir um, Erlang with macros at the time. You know, there was a lot of cool niceties, um, but it didn't have what it has today, which is um, an expanding standard library. Um, I feel like the standard library is really where Elixir is beginning to blossom. Um, I feel the, uh, the, uh, the uh, stuff, the, the enhancement to OTP that Elixir is giving us with things like uh, nested access. I've already talked about that. This is kind of an advanced example, so I won't go into it. Um, but with agents, um, you know, a while back when we wanted uh, global state, we had to implement a gen server. And I'm not sure if anybody's implemented, uh, you know, hundreds of gen servers in Erlang other than the people that raise their hands in here. But um, it was a pain in the butt, right? So uh, there was a ton of ceremony involved. Um, and, uh, you know, agents kind of do away with all that. You know, if you want to store some global state easily um, and, you know, start and stop um, an agent, it's really easy to do that. So, here we go. Tasks, tasks have already been talked about, so I won't go too much into those. But um, I believe, uh, Francisco mentioned uh, Amdahl's Law, uh, I believe it was pronounced, so I did a little Googling on that. And I think a good takeaway to, to take away from tasks that have been mentioned is if you have a bunch of blocking calls, um, turn them into tasks. You know, use uh, async, use await, and all of a sudden uh, that block of code only becomes as slow as the slowest task is to return, right? So streams. So streams are, I think, the coolest part, the coolest new addition to uh, the um, standard library. Um, I really feel that more than anything, streams are gonna become what really uh, makes people rethink how um, how things can be modeled um, in the standard library and in their own applications. 
Here we just have a really contrived uh, example of streams. Um, it's basically infinite series. Um, not sure if how many people here have experience with yeah, Haskell or you know other languages that have um, lazy enumerables, but um, here we're just uh, we're basically creating an infinite stream of uh, rats and hoodlums because you know they like to hang out in the sewer, um, and we are um, cycling through those and adding them to a room or whatever. So, uh, you know, let's say you go into a room and you need 10 baddies in there. If you take 10 baddies from that stream, um, you're gonna have a distribution of, uh, of, of rats and hoodlums um, based on the uh, number that we took there. So, this is also how uh, I implemented this. This is a uh, chunked PMAP. Uh, PMAP seems to be um, like the canonical um, example uh, that Erlang programmers like to re-implement all the time. Um, I think I've seen like five implementations of it. Um, and this is a chunked PMAP using only streams and tasks. So um, what a chunk PMAP is, is uh, it's, if you have a uh, series of things, like let's say one to 100, um, you can take a chunk of those, like 10, and spawn only 10 tasks uh, to do some calculations on those 10 things. And um, at the end of that, take the next 10, and take the next 10, et cetera, and uh, you know, combine them all into one. So um, probably the right way to do this would be to do, uh, uh, to use a pool of uh, workers, maybe, um, and uh, not use a new task for everyone. But I think it's a uh, cool example, nonetheless. So logger, it's not in the standard library yet. Um, but I think this was the last uh, big thing, for me at least, that I felt uh, Elixir needed, and I think a lot of people felt that way too, um, uh, especially since Jose thinks that it's the last thing that we need before 1.0. So how many people have seen an error like this before? Yeah, I mean, you look at something like this and you're pretty much like, so, so I don't know if you knew you can actually supervise tasks. So this is a task, uh, a fake one, that just raises Kurt Stinks. And without the logger, you get this mess of Erlang terms. Um, and Jose was talking about this, but this is what it actually looks like. Um, and you know we've all seen this stuff before. It's it's how Erlang sees Elixir code, um, and it's just a mess. With the logger, looks much better, right? So, um, and the logger has backends, of course, that you can uh, plug your own stuff into. So that's really cool. The tooling, um, the tooling of Elixir, um, I feel. Uh, at least when I was being introduced to it, was uh, a huge boon. Um, I feel like it's some of the most advanced uh, tooling for a new language, um, at least that I can find out there. Um, IEX um, for REPL, MIX, uh, building X unit, unit test, hex, package management, EXRM, release management, um, a lot of really cool stuff. IEX, I'm not sure, so this is a little module, uh, a combat module, um, and it's basically just a simple module that um, calculates the difference between the two players that want to fight and um, gives a uh, combat log for them, right? So how many people knew about IEX.pry? Couple, okay, so 
with IEX.pry, you can um, uh, you can stop the uh, interpreter. You can inspect at any point um, the binding of variables in your Elixir code. Um, it's for the JavaScript developers out there. It's kind of like the debugger statement of Elixir. Um, so when this code is run and we run the combat function, all we have to do is just um, allow it to be pried and then we can be begin inspecting um, the, uh, the bindings at that point in the, uh, in the program. Uh, doc tests, they've already been mentioned a little bit, but um, it's, it's huge. Uh, coming from a Python background, it was like really nice when they were introduced um, and apparently the syntax highlighter can't handle. Uh, code and docs together, so. Um, but, um, you know, it, the documentation as a first class citizen in Elixir is um, a concept that I really get behind. I think uh, using uh, doc tests in your code to test your code is a really easy way to both document and, uh, and test at the same time, so. Hex. Um, it was already mentioned in Eric's talk. Uh, at least at my table, I heard a lot of people uh, express the desire to actually see um, how do you actually publish a hex package? You know, how do you actually use it other than um, you know just pulling in packages? So this is this is a, just an example of um, what it would look like if I published my uh, library exec.js on hex. I just create a package. Um, keyword list and have some meta information in there. And then I just do mix hex.publish and it publishes it to the cloud pretty much. So pretty cool. The ecosystem. Um, the ecosystem of Elixir is already really rich. Um, we have a lot of uh, cool projects out there already. A lot of them seem web centric. I'd like to see. Um, some more non-web centric projects out there, but Plug is really cool. Um, this is a example from the Plug um, library itself. Um, it is a, uh, a plug that takes the connection, um, and remember plugs are completely composable, so you can stack them as much as you want. It takes the connection if the method of the HTTP request is a head, it just turns the method into a get. That's literally all it does. Um, and these are powerful because, uh, the, these simple plugs are powerful because you can, um, because you can compose them with uh, other plugs. Um, Ecto, um, Ecto's really cool. Uh, I can't imagine doing a query like this in too many other languages. Um, the power of uh, macros that I mentioned earlier are put to really good use in, uh, in Ecto. Um, and um, even though uh, I know that Jose was poo-pooing it, I know that he uh, at least read a lot of stuff on Link when he was originally designing this, whether he wants to admit it or not. Um, uh, honorable mention, Phoenix Calliope. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Calliope, okay. Um, Hound, uh, Hound's by my uh, coworker, Akash. Um, I think uh, tools like Hound, which is kind of a continuous integration testing um, using WebDriver, um, written in Elixir, you can write the whole thing in Elixir. Our entire test suite for our current application is written uh, in Elixir right now. Um, Jazz, honorable mention. Um, I know that may have spent a lot of time on that. Um, but uh, I really feel like there's, um, there's a, a really high quality libraries already, but I think there needs to be more. So um, the dream for me, the thing that would really uh, excite me even more um, for Elixir, if we had a breakpoint capable debugger, 
Um, I know that there was already some research into that. Um, I'd like to see it taken further. Um, quick check for Elixir. Um, when I originally implemented uh, Poolboy, um, which is a pooling library for Erlang, um, and I released it to the world, I had this guy, uh, Andrew Thompson, uh, he basically took my library, uh, quick checked it, and found that the whole thing was wrong. So um, uh, it's a really powerful um, way of testing your application, and I'd like to see a you know, pure Elixir, maybe even integrated uh, way to use some kind of quick check like um, testing. Um, in a lazy parsing framework, um, I think with streams and um, uh, maybe even tasks, maybe even parsing stuff in, in multiple processes, I'm not sure. Um, there needs to be uh, stuff like uh, lazy JSON parsers or lazy uh, XML parsers maybe. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with stacks in Java. Um, well, actually, there needs, to be, <laughs> there needs to be an XML parser other than XMERL in early. Let's just say that. Um, and my company's hiring. Clutch Analytics, we're based here in Austin. So um, if anybody's interested in working on Elixir full-time, come talk to me. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs>